Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome, welcome. We'll wait another minute or 30 seconds or so to get the to get things started. Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome and thank you for joining us today. My name is Donald Chi. I am the net from the Navajo Nation. I am the program coordinator for the National Native HIV Network under the Community Health Education and Resiliency Program at the Albuquerque Area Indian Health Board. I come to you today from the ancestral homelands of the Diné Apache, Pueblo, and Ute people of the Southwest region of the United States. On behalf of the National Native HIV Network, we welcome you to today's webinar titled Congenital Syphilis, a Community Response. Before we begin the presentations, I would like to give a brief overview of the National Native HIV Network, followed by some housekeeping announcements. The network was created in 2017 as a community-led response to increase and organize a national voice and presence in the HIV movement from the American Indian, Alaska Native, and Native Hawaiian communities. With support from the Indian Health Service and the Health and Human Services Office of the Secretary's Minority HIV AIDS Fund, the Albuquerque Area Indian Health Board coordinates a wide array of key stakeholders from the 12 IHS areas to form the National Native HIV Network. The network provides input and guidance to assist IHS and other agencies and efforts to reach high-risk American Indian and Alaska Native and Native Hawaiian populations with HIV testing, prevention, and treatment. The network builds group capacity and provides assistance to support extensive community engagement strategies, dissemination of information of regional and national levels, and supports professional and leadership development to sustain these efforts. Our comprehensive approach is rooted in our cultural values, teachings, and affection for our communities. We have a few housekeeping announcements. Um, first, the session will be recorded and will be shared on our YouTube channel. Facebook page and on the network webpage at www.nnhn.org. If you aren't already a member, please sign up for a free membership there to learn more about the network and to receive our monthly newsletter and upcoming event information. Second, please drop your, your questions in the chat box. We will hold off on questions and answers at the end of um, Andrew, our first presenter and our last presenter. Um, our second presenter, Cheryl, we will hold the questions after her presentation. And lastly, um, we'll have an evaluation that we'll send out at the end of this webinar. Um, please complete those and send those back to us. Okay, today we have three wonderful presenters who are doing great work for our Native communities at the national and local levels. I'm so happy that they were willing to come here today to share their lived experiences and knowledge that will benefit all Native communities. Without further ado, I'll introduce our first esteemed presenter. Andrew Yu comes to us from Washington, DC. Andrew is the National Clinical Coordinator for the HIV HCV STI program at IHS headquarters. In his role, he provides technical assistance to ITU programs on topics related to the HIV pandemic. He's also an HIV certified registered nurse who has, been, who has been working with people living with HIV and providing sexual health services for the past 12 years. He received his bachelor's of science degree in nursing from Georgetown University and his master's in community and public health nursing from Hunter College in New York City. 
Okay, Andrew, take it away. All right, thank you so much, Donald. Just want to make sure that everyone can see my screen. Okay. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Andrew Yu from the National HIV Hep C S T I program at IHS headquarters. We're here, of course, to talk about syphilis today with an emphasis on congenital syphilis. I started my nursing career a dozen years ago in the neonatal ICU, where congenital syphilis cases were rarely seen. Unfortunately, that is no longer the case, and I'm grateful that so many of you have joined today to continue discussing what we as a community can do to help bend the curve and keep our relatives and those that we care for safe and healthy. Before we dive into congenital syphilis, we'll briefly do an overview of syphilis. Syphilis is an STI's call back to caused by the bacteria called Treponema pallidum. The most common route of transmission is through sexual contact, but it can also be transmitted vertically between a pregnant person who has acquired syphilis onto their baby. Unlike other bacterial STIs, such as gonorrhea or chlamydia, if syphilis is left untreated, it goes through several different stages and treatment is dependent on that staging. The first stage of syphilis after the incubation period is called primary syphilis. A chancre or an open sore marks the onset of the stage and appears at the location where the bacteria enters the body. Because this is an open sore, this is the most infectious stage of syphilis and the likelihood of transmission is the highest. Symptoms of primary syphilis are similar regardless of pregnancy status. Chancres will resolve on their own regardless of whether someone has been adequately treated, and this unfortunately provides a false sense of security for those who do not receive treatment. While the symptoms may have resolved, the active infection has not. If primary syphilis is left untreated, the next stage is called secondary. A rash marks the second stage of symptoms. Back in nursing school, we were taught that syphilis rashes are generally isolated to the palms of hands and soles of feet, but they can in fact appear anywhere on the body. Syphilitic rashes can appear similar to other rashes naturally seen in pregnancy, such as eczema, making diagnosing secondary syphilis upon exam even more difficult during pregnancy. Similar to primary syphilis, symptoms resolve on their own with or without treatment, again, providing a false sense of security for those who are left untreated. If left untreated, the next stage of syphilis is called latency. This is where there are no visible signs or symptoms of syphilis, but infection remains. Latency is split into two categories. Early latent syphilis is the time period where the infection occurs within the past 12 months. Late latent syphilis is when the infection occurs more than 12 months ago. Syphilis of unknown duration is when there is not enough evidence to confirm when the initial infection occurred. So we'll treat it as a late latent stage. Because latent syphilis is not transmitted sexually, the objective of treating persons in this stage is to prevent medical complications of syphilis. However, latent syphilis can be vertically transmitted to a fetus. Neuroocular and otosyphilis can occur at any stage. It doesn't have to be months or years after infection. If left untreated, it can lead to permanent damage, such as paralysis, loss of sight, and hearing. And finally, tertiary syphilis occurs decades after infection if left untreated and can be fatal due to multiple organ systems being affected. Whereas syphilis is an STI, congenital syphilis is not, as transmission occurs when a pregnant person with syphilis passes the infection onto their baby. There are several different factors that are needed to determine whether a baby has congenital syphilis, which includes blood tests and titers of the pregnant person, whether the pregnant person was adequately treated, as well as the blood tests and titers of the baby, along with the physical exam and imaging. A baby born with syphilis may not necessarily have signs or symptoms at birth, but without immediate treatment, the baby may develop serious complications within a few weeks, including mortality. 
Prior to the surge of congenital syphilis cases in recent years, testing recommendations differed for those considered quote unquote high risk or for those residing in areas of high prevalence of syphilis. Given that syphilis and congenital syphilis cases have skyrocketed in nearly every corner of the country, we now recommend testing for all pregnant people three times, at the first prenatal visit, during the third trimester, and at the time of delivery. Adequate treatment for the pregnant person is defined as the completion of a penicillin-based regimen initiated 30 or more days before delivery. As a reminder, pregnant people can only receive a penicillin-based regimen for treatment, and all other alternatives are not recommended. If a true allergy to penicillin exists, one must be desensitized inpatient, where under close supervision, a small amount of penicillin is administered and gradually increased until the full dosing is achieved. CDC outlines four possible scenarios of congenital syphilis, which will guide the level of testing and treatment for the newborn, ranging from scenario one, where congenital syphilis is confirmed, to scenario four, where congenital syphilis is unlikely. As mentioned in the previous slide, if the pregnant person was treated, but it was initiated less than 30 days before delivery, that would shift the likelihood of congenital syphilis from scenario three, which is congenital syphilis less likely, to scenario two, which is possible congenital syphilis, which warrants additional evaluation, testing, and treatment. Following treatment of congenital syphilis, all newborns should receive follow-up exams and testing every two to three months until that test becomes non-reactive. This map shows the stark difference in primary and secondary syphilis cases between 2012 and 2021, where syphilis cases have increased in nearly every state. In just a few days, CDC will be releasing 2022 STI data for the public, so please keep an eye out. When looking at the data by race and ethnicity, American Indian Alaska Native people currently have the highest rates of primary and secondary syphilis, surpassing the Black population for the first time. The Native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islanders are not far back. When breaking it down by gender, American Indian Alaska Native females have by far the highest rates of primary and secondary syphilis compared to any other group. CDC also provides a ranking by state for primary and secondary syphilis, with many of the top states overlapping with Indian country. For congenital syphilis, this map also depicts the increase in cases between 2012 and 2021 throughout the country. Similar to primary and secondary syphilis, uh, the native population currently have the highest rates of congenital syphilis, as well as the highest increase in rates in recent years. Ranking by states for congenital syphilis rates also reveal significant overlap with Indian country. IHS is getting ready to publish an updated syphilis memo from Dr. Christensen, the chief medical officer. The current guidance already highlights the need to provide three-point syphilis testing for all pregnant people. Express STI testing where patients don't need to make appointments to be seen for STI-related care and providing testing and treatment in non-traditional settings have helped reach the most vulnerable populations. Presumptive treatment of syphilis for anyone showing signs or symptoms of syphilis or with a known ex exposure should be offered. I want the kit, which is an in-home STI specimen collection lab-based testing service that IHS supports in partnership with Johns Hopkins University plans on adding syphilis and pregnancy testing, as well as HIV, Hep B, and Hep C testing soon. We're also looking at contracts to pilot vending machines that would include STI testing kits, pregnancy tests, as well as harm reduction supplies to help with the syphilis and congenital syphilis response. The updates to the syphilis letter will also include urgent care, ED testing and treatment, the use of rapid testing and providing immediate treatment, and the treatment of partners or contacts with a penicillin-based regimen. There are currently two CLIA wave point-of-care tests available for syphilis. The first option is a rapid finger stick test that looks for chaponemal antibodies and only takes about 10 minutes to result. 
Because it's an antibody test, anyone with a prior history of syphilis, regardless of treatment, would not be eligible for this test, since those antibodies usually remain active for life. The second option combines both the treponemal and HIV antibody tests. It only takes a few minutes longer than the previous option, but shares the same limitations for people having a history of syphilis not being eligible. This test also requires a microreader to interpret results, reducing the possibility of human error when visually inspecting, as there no longer is a question whether the appearance of a faint line is positive or not. When ordering, just a reminder that the controls are shipped separately on dry ice and must be immediately refri uh, refrigerated upon receipt, and that the microreader is good for about a thousand reads. Diagnosis Direct is looking to donate rapid syphilis tests to tribal and urban clinics and health departments within Indian country. Due to ethics restrictions, IHS cannot directly receive donations of free tests. If you are able and interested in receiving test donations, please reach out to Kate at cshea at ncsddc.org. There are currently plenty of tests available for donation. Although the two CLIA wave tests have expanded the ability to test for syphilis in and outside the clinical setting, there still is a need for additional types of tests, especially for those who have a history of syphilis aren't, and aren't eligible for the rapid test currently available. This means having a rapid confirmatory test that can provide titers, also testing that can directly detect syphilis for newborns at birth, and testing options that don't require a blood sample. Treatment of primary, secondary, and early latent syphilis is straightforward, a single shot of penicillin IM. Treatment of late latent or syphilis of unknown duration requires the same injection, but given three times a week apart. For pregnant people, the absolute maximum number of days in between injections is nine days. Otherwise, you would have to repeat the entire series over. For non-pregnant people, you can go up to 14 days in between doses before having to restart the series, but it's always ideal to stick as closely to the seven-day interval as much as possible. The yarrick scherzheimer reaction is a response that may happen shortly after receiving penicillin for syphilis treatment. It's a reaction to treatment and not an allergic reaction to penicillin. The reaction occurs from the release of endotoxins when bacteria is killed, Symptoms can be self-managed and resolved quickly. The reaction might induce early labor or cause fetal distress in pregnancy, but this should not prevent or delay therapy as the risks of not treating syphilis are far greater and more likely to occur. To recap, timing is essential, especially when it comes to congenital syphilis. Testing three times during pregnancy, initiating penicillin 30 or more days prior to delivery if syphilis is, requ is required, and not going longer than nine days in between doses of needing multiple injections. Another reminder that penicillin is the only option to treat syphilis in pregnant people and is the preferred agent for any stage and at any, any age and any stage. The messaging from IHS leadership is that penicillin is available and there are multiple avenues to obtain penicillin, either through McKesson or the National Supply Service Center. For questions about how to order penicillin through NSSC, please contact Captain Thompson at weston.thompson at ihs.gov. In recent weeks, it's also been reported that the U.S. has imported a significant amount of penicillin-based product from, uh, called Extensiline to add additional options for treatment. Anyone who has ordered or tried to order Exensilin, if you can please email me or share in the chat your experience of any barriers or lessons learned with ordering the meds and administration. When setting up a workflow to offer field treatment of syphilis, there are several necessary components, which include standing orders and the availability of staff, coordination with pharmacy and equipment. This includes a temperature control cooler to maintain penicillin, an emergency kit with an EpiPen, and standing orders that cover its use, and the flexibility and availability to meet patients that may suddenly change from the originally agreed upon time and location. It's important to note when obtaining buy-in from stakeholders to start providing field-based care to remind everyone that this strategy is not meant to replace traditional testing and treatment, 
but rather it's a supplement for those who can't or won't come into the clinical setting to receive their care. These reasons include, but are not limited to transportation difficulties, childcare, substance use, and anyone who is pregnant. If interested in implementing field-based treatment, please reach out as we have several public health nursing staff who have been uh, providing this care already and can be of assistance. Doxypep has been gaining more traction as an STI prevention strategy where you take a single dose of doxy within three days after having sex without condoms to prevent common bacterial STIs, including syphilis. However, the guidelines currently only, currently only include the adult MSM and trans women population. Also, as another reminder that doxy is contraindicated for pregnant people as tetracyclines may cause fatty liver disease in the pregnant person and cause fetal tooth staining and decay. And lastly, incentives have been a game changer when it comes to enhancing testing and treatment efforts and especially helpful in preventing congenital syphilis cases. They are currently being used in the clinical setting as well as out in the field. IHS landed on a $30 limit per person per visit, and the most popular forms of incentives have been gas cards to assist with transportation or other general gift cards that can be used to purchase hygiene products and food. A lesson that we quickly learned was that if a patient needs three weekly penicillin injections to treat late latent or syphilis of unknown duration, Rather than providing a gift card after each injection, wait until the patient comes in after their third and final injection and then provide the maximum $30 to ensure treatment completion. And please check out a number of resources we have available related to syphilis. And here is my contact information as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Andrew, for that presentation. Again, questions for Andrew uh, will be held until the end of all three presentations. Okay, our next presenter comes to us from Montana. Cheryl Bighorn Savior is from the Fort Peck, Assiniboine, and Sioux tribes. Cheryl started her health care career in 1998 as a CNA working in long-term care. <clears throat> she graduated from Salish Kootenai College with her RN degree in 2004. <clears throat> She's been a surgical nurse, clinical nurse, case manager, diabetes educator, a director of nursing, COVID nurse, and last year she transitioned from COVID to STI. Today, Cheryl will be sharing um, some in implementation of syphilis testing and treatment strategies, and also sharing the success um, the Fort Peck, Fort, Fort Peck tribe has had with changing the tribal code that criminalized pregnant women who use drugs. Cheryl, are you ready to go? Hi, uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you, okay. Donald. Thank you, Andrew. That was a wonderful presentation. I never tire of watching your presentation. Um, so my name is Cheryl Bighorn Savior. I am an enrolled member here at Fort Peck. I'm Dakota Sioux. Um, I was a COVID response team nurse. And last year, we were contacted by the, the public health nursing through the Fort Peck IHS service unit. Um, Don Bent had come to our director and said, you know, syphilis is such a huge thing in our communities and it's COVID was important, but since COVID was kind of dying out at that time and the numbers weren't as high and as elevated as they were, we thought we were going to get laid off. But thanks to Dawn Bent came and she was like, you know, we could really use your help with boots on the ground. So we were able to get certified in the point of care testing and we had four syphilis deaths in 2022, which our communities aren't very big. We have six communities. Um, our biggest community is Wolf Point. We've got roughly about 2,500 people um, in Wolf Point. We're very, very rural. Um, we have a lot of people that don't have 
a neighbor within five miles. When I say we're rural, we drive 70 miles to go shopping for our clothes. So we are very, very rural. Um, having four syphilis congenital deaths was traumatizing. Um, everybody pretty much knows everybody in our area. Um, it was very sad and Don realized that IHS needed help. So by certifying us to do the point of care testing, we went through training with, gosh, Jessica Leston, um, Christy Acklestead with the state, Andrew Yu, Rebecca Horowitz with NACO, and Hillary Hansen was our defining moment. Um, she was able to, and I'm sorry, Hillary Hansen is with the Montana Public Health Institute. She was able to bring Dr. Melanie Taylor, who is um, with the CDC, and she's a medical epidemiologist. And she came and spoke with our tribal executive board members. And before she had spoken with them, if anybody was pregnant um, and wanted testing for STIs or anything like that, they were charged. Um, they were put in jail and their unborn child is what they had worried about. So they thought if they put them in jail and kept them in jail until they delivered, um, they were protecting the baby. So a lot of people just stopped going. They just refused to go to prenatal visits, um, to even come in and get tested for pregnancy. So that is, they believe that is why we had so many congenital deaths. So we got together and we were point of care certified. So we were able to test with Dr. Taylor speaking with the tribal executive board. Um, we were able to change the CCOJ. Um, so the laws around testing somebody who is seeking testing for STIs. So they can now come in and as a mandatory reporter, if they are coming in to get tested for syphilis, gonorrhea, chlamydia, hepatitis, HIV, we no longer report that as a criminal. So they can come in, they can get tested, they can get treated even if it's, you know, latent, whichever stage it is in, we treat them, but keep babies safe and keep them out of jail. So that has opened doors for so many people wanting to come in. With that, we did have to make some changes because letting people know that they were still really kind of really apprehensive about coming in to see us. Um, it's, it's been beneficial because if they come in for a pregnancy test, we've started testing. We offer it, you know, we can test you for HIV. We can test you for hep hepatitis C. One of the most important is syphilis. And a lot of people didn't realize that it's a bacteria. So we're able to treat them right then, you know, if it comes back positive and, you know, Thanks to Hillary Henson and Christy Acklestead at the state, and they provided the incentives for. So we we also have the incentives that we can give them, and we follow IHS's guides for that. So if it's latent, then we wait until you know they come back for their three treatments, um, and them knowing that they're going to get that money, they do come back. They make sure that they come back and and follow through. I think a lot of people don't realize that even if they're using drugs or whatever while they're pregnant, they still care about their unborn child. They want the best for them also. So by providing them with the testing and the treatment and education, um, 
you know, we provide them with condoms for males, for females. It, it's really, really helped. And we've had a lot of people come in and say, you know, that's, they felt comfortable coming to a tribal program in, instead of having to go to the IHS only because they felt like this stigmatism around a pregnant person wanting to get STI tested without having to be put in jail, you know, they're more willing to work with us. And that has been phenomenal. We um, also started testing out at the jail. We did a mass testing. We were able to get six brand new um, syphilis cases. They were treated that day um, and given an incentive we were also able to catch 18 that were latent and just had not, they like they were tested at the IHS. They knew that they had it, but they did not complete the treatment. So we were able to work with the judge and hold them until their treatment was completed. And then they were released afterward with the incentive cards um, we've also been working with the judge with our juvenile detention centers. And if anybody, a juvenile comes in and they feel, you know, they might have something, um, they contact us and we go in there and we test them and we treat them if it's needed. Um, we've also set up a system with the, the tribal jail where they contact us for new inmates and it is now tribal tribally set up so any new inmate we test as soon as they get there so that is has been a huge benefit also as soon as they get there we test them we treat them we give them education um, we're also doing and offering treatment physicals through spotted bull treatment center and um, a few other treatment centers so when they come in for their physical, their, they get their TB test and we offer them the syphilis, hepatitis C and HIV testing. Um, we've had a few positives. As soon as they test positive, we treat them that day. Um, if they you know, have a history, of course, we send them to lab and we get their RPR and everything. And we work with them so that we make sure all of their testing their treatments, their education. Um, we, you know, like I said, we offer um, condoms, incentives. We also have um, Francis is our nurse practitioner and she's just phenomenal working with them to make sure we're looking at the whole person. I think a lot of times we almost got focused on, we, we just need to get them in and get them tested. So we were trying to meet them where they were, um, but there there's a lot of street people and a lot of drug use. And I've had, you know, a lot of people that come in and they, when we're discussing things and they say, well, I don't like to go in because I haven't showered in two weeks. So we are able to work with um, Kind of our homeless shelters also so we can get their clothes washed they can shower um have a hot meal and a safe place to stay and the shelters will actually bring them over so that we can complete their treatment and it's worked out really really well um that's all you know it's it's really we're just changing things and trying to get into a groove because we are a new program and we've only been doing this since, correct me if I'm wrong, Andrew, but I think it's June is when we we started learning and then we started doing all of the testing and making changes within our tribe and this tribal health program in June or July. But we've we've caught quite a few and we've, it, I, th I think that we're doing a really good job. Um, we try to, learn from the patients more um, only because they're they're the ones that we're trying to reach so by asking them questions you know how would this work for you 
they're able to respond to us like, you know, well, I, I don't like to go get tested because I, I don't have clean clothes or, you know, I haven't showered in two weeks. By us knowing those little details for them, we're, we're able to work with the patient to try and ensure that they do come back and see us. The lab has at IHS has been phenomenal um, in making sure that we've, you know, we get all of our lab results back as soon as possible. Um, and, you know, just reaching out. Every time I have a question, I'm always reaching out to different programs. Um, the Portland Indian Health Board has been wonderful. Donald um, Chi and Kurt Begay, I thank you guys very, very much because you provide so much education for us also being a new program that we're able to kind of look at different things and go, oh, okay, that's how this program kind of looks, you know, and does things. It, it really is trial and error, but we're coming up on a year here in a few months and we're, we're just trying to do the best impact that we can to help our people. Does anybody have any questions for me? Hey, Cheryl, um, there is a question for clarity. Um, explain why are why people are put in jail if they are pregnant and have an STI, and they're slightly confused over that. So uh, maybe just so, go ahead. Yeah, so our tribe used to, um, because the drug epidemic got so bad on our reservation that they had felt by criminalizing somebody that was pregnant and putting them in jail would help keep their baby safe. If they're not using drugs and they're not um, on the streets, they felt that they were safe, they were getting fed, um, you know, they were seen by a medical provider, but it didn't really fully work because then people just quit going to the clinics and they didn't want to get tested because they were on drugs or they were drinking and they felt like nobody understood them. So by criminalizing it, they were taking the pregnant person out of their elements and putting them in jail and holding them there until the baby was born or until they were put into a treatment center um, people just quit going to get tested at all. And they would hide at home and even their family. Well, we don't want them, you know, to go to jail just because they're pregnant. So it was almost like a hiding and covering up. So by decriminalizing that, they can come into a clinic, get tested, get treatment, without us having to report them as a pregnant person who is on drugs or drinking. And I hope that clarified it. Okay, so I'm reading the comments and um, thank you for the explanation. And they said, yes, it doesn't seem to be very client-centered approach. I'm glad it has changed and you all are part of the change. Any other questions for Cheryl? Okay, thank you, Cheryl. Um, in the interest of time, um, we're gonna move forward with our next presenter, but I just wanted to all, um, announce again that you can access our um, website at www.nnhn.org where you can access um, other HIV resources and upcoming webinars. Again, thank you, Cheryl, for that wonderful presentation. Any other questions for Cheryl, you can drop them in the chat box um, and we can um, um, discuss those at the very end. Okay, um, our last presenter comes to us from Hawaii. <clears throat> uh, 
um, BJ Craveo um, is a registered. Can you unpack it for me? Oh, oh, I already. BJ, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, BJ comes to us from Hawaii. She is an RN and the clinical clinic manager at Kumakahi Health and Wellness, I, Iola Sexual Health Clinic. BJ is a native Hawaiian Kanaka Maui, born and raised in Hilo, Hawaii. She is currently working towards her credentials as an APRN with a specialty in HIV care. BJ has been with Kumakahi Health and Wellness for three years and was recently promoted into the position of clinic manager. Congratulations on that promotion, BJ. So today, BJ's presentation is congenital syphilis's impact on Pacific Island communities. She'll provide an overview of the Iola Sexual Health Clinic, uh, history of syphilis in Hawaii, the current state of infection in Pacific Island people, and ASH, ASH Clinic's syphilis program. Thank you, BJ, for providing this presentation today, and I'll hand it over to you. Okay, I just wanted to ensure, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Okay. Um, so thank you everybody um, for taking time out of your busy schedule to attend today's webinar. I'm gonna be doing a brief overview of congenital syphilis. So aloha my kako, I am BJ Crivello. I am a registered nurse and clinic manager for Iola Sexual Health Clinic. It is a division of Kumukai Health and Wellness. Born and raised here in Hawaii, my nursing background spans over 10 years with expertise in surgical care, community health center, and specialty care, specifically HIV. I am attending Chamberlain University, where I'll be graduating in June with my master's degree in nursing with an emphasis in family nurse practitioner. I've been with Kumukai Health and Wellness since 2021, where I started off as a nurse case manager. So Kumakai Health and Wellness has been serving the Hawaii Island community in a variety of capacities since 1985. The organization was known as Hawaii Island HIV AIDS Foundation since 2003 and decided to embark on a rebranding in 2021 to reflect the growth and changes in our organization. We have grown from a support group of a few staff and volunteers providing simple support to an agency that saves lives and helps to educate our community and provide life-saving services for some of our island's most vulnerable population. So you may ask, how do we do this? So we recognize and address the social determinants and impacts a person's health enhancing the quality of life for all of our participants, including equal access to healthcare, establishing ourselves as a center of excellence for accessible client-centered and culturally specific support and care in Hawaii and the Pacific. We serve all 400 square miles of Hawaii Island out of two locations and through lots and lots of outreach in the community. I'm sure everybody can relate to that. Both of our offices are located 200 miles apart and yet we strive to keep the daily operations as cohesive as possible to reduce barriers and gaps in care. Both offices are open Monday through Friday from 8.30 to 4.30 except for holidays and trainings. Clinic hours for our Hilo location is Tuesday and Friday from 10 to 4 p.m. And for Kona, we see patients on Thursdays from 10 to 3 p.m. Kumakai Health and Wellness is one of the few agencies here in Hawaii that provides various department services to support an individual who is living with HIV. 
services that our agency offers includes our Po'e department, uh, prevention, outreach, and education through our Po'e department, who participates in community outreach programs, SDI testing at universities, and linkage to care for PrEP, HIV, gender-affirming care, and Hep C. Next is our Kokua Service Partnership, which is KSP, who plays an integral role within the community by offering a place for individuals to sign up for health insurance through Medicaid or Medicare. Our HIV Medical Case Management Department Client Services works together with our patients to ensure they have access to their HIV medication, housing, food, and medical care through their primary care provider and HIV specialty clinics. Lastly, Iola Sexual Health Clinic provides a comprehensive and patient-centered approach to caring for our community, as well as promoting harm reduction services. So we, we often hear about the amazing work we do here, yet I want to acknowledge our staff who are committed to providing services to individuals in a non-judgmental setting. Although our staff is small in numbers, the impact in our community is pronounced. So kudos to the staff. Um, so next, I want to go. We have our, introduce our Iola Sexual Health Clinic team. We have our medical consultant, who is Dr. Mark Knox. He is a retired family medicine specialist and currently a residency faculty physician at Hilo Medical Center. He brings over 29 years of experience in the field of HIV. Next, we have our phenomenal um, provider on staff, Naomi Whitaker, who's at APRN. Um, she's our current medical provider. She brings over six years of experience in acute hospital medicine and five years and counting of community health care serving the Big Island. Bubbles is our medical receptionist in our Kona office. She's been with our agency since 2022. Lastly, we have Kohula, who is our patient services representative in our Hilo office. She recently joined our agency in September of 2023. Our services encompass a variety of sexual health needs, ranging from HIV to gender-affirming care, Hep C treatments, PEP and PrEP, and SDI treatments. Future goals for the clinic include expansion of services through mobile health outreach, addition of another provider and support staff, and lastly, becoming a teaching center for future medical and nurse practitioner students who wish to specialize in HIV. So I just wanna go over the processes of how we receive our referrals. It could be internally, externally, or through partner services with the Department of Health. So internal referrals, these are coming from our POE department. So from a testing standpoint, the linkage to care starts with a patient seeking STI testing services through our POE team. If the syphilis rapid test that Andrew talked about earlier is positive, the patient will be sent with a confirmatory lab requisition and instructed to proceed to their lab of their choice for a blood draw. Results will interface into the patient's chart within three to four days. And if the diagnosis is confirmed, our provider will task the frontline staff, that is Bubbles and Kogula, um, to set up an appointment to review the labs at that time. Once the patient is in the clinic, we then go ahead and review those results with them again. We collect a thorough sexual health history to determine the best course of treatment. For external referrals, our clinic receives the same process. So we'll receive the RPR at this time. So we're getting the confirmatory RPR test results with the titer and the office notes. Usually this comes from a community partner, like their primary care setting or urgent care. Patient is notified through their primary care office to expect a call from our clinic to set up an appointment for consultation and treatment. Again, the workflow is they'll meet with the provider. She'll do the thorough sexual health history and review with them what the treatment options will look at. Last but not least, we have our partnership services through the Department of Health. 
and our referrals normally come in um, from Siobhan, who is our liaison there. So our clinic will receive the confirmatory RPR lab with the titers, along with the patient's name and contact information. Siobhan, who is our contact within DOH, will often facilitate a three-way call. So it would be myself, the patient, and Siobhan. And what she will do is introduce the patient to our clinic and provide support to the patient to ensure their appointment is made and that the individual has transportation. Siobhan is also intricate in her role is that she will also follow up on cases that we refer back to her. And it could be due to non-compliance or poor adhesion to the treatment regimen. So to understand the gravity of the state of congenital syphilis amongst Hawaiians and other Pacific Islanders, you have to understand its history in Hawaii. For centuries, the Hawaiian Islands has remained untouched and uninfluenced by foreigners. The people of Hawaii were vibrant, healthy, and we were known for our strength and size. Everyday life in Hawaii was centered around a well-balanced society based on the term Mauliola, the idea of health and wellness in a communal, physical, mental, and spiritual way. This Mauliola health and wellness can be seen in three specific areas that I'm going to show you. So La'au Lapa'au is a traditional medical, medical practice in Hawaii. The words La'au and Lapa'au means vegetation and treat, heal, or cure. The history of La'au Lapa'au has been shared generation to generation for over a thousand years. In a native Hawaiian culture, it is believed that health is a result of pono, or right living, and that the loss of harmony and balance causes illness. Traditional Native Hawaiian medicinal practices are based on holistic healing in which the mind, body, and spirit are intertwined. Again, Maoli Ola, but physical illness is still present in every community. And in Hawaii, physical ailments still relied on medicinal relief. Laau la Pao. When missionaries arrived in Hawaii in 1820, they believed that Laau la Pao was black magic and they moved for it to be outlawed or banned. Although the practice was banned back there, our kahuna continued to practice in secret and it's still practiced still till today. Hawaiians have a very special relationship with land, a familiar connection. Although some of these plants are not easily available today, it was not uncommon to farm these types of plant life for regular usage. We accomplished this through the Ahapua system. Until the Great Mahele or land division to make room for foreigners on each of the four larger islands, Kauai, Oahu, Maui and Hawaii lands were divided into wedge-shaped districts called Moku. The moku were further divided into land sections called ahapua. Ahapua were often bounded by ridge lines and typically encompass an entire valley from the mountain top summits to the outer reefs. This type of land division allowed for each ahapua to contain nearly all of the resources that its inhabitants required for survival and the impacts on the natural water systems and ecological footprint was minimal because everything was carefully balanced through returning the water to the streams, the natural recycle process of taro, one of our main sources of nutrition, and through the kapu system. The kapu system was a religious and political code in old Hawaii. It forbidden many things and demanded many more with many infractions being punishable by death. And my slide just kind of indicates the different type of couple systems. It was actually three, religion, rank, and governance. English seafarer Captain James Cook sighted Oahu on January 18th, 1978, and stepped ashore at Waimea on Kauai two days later. Upon his arrival, the population of the Hawaiian Islands was estimated to be at around a half a million people. 
Some say that number was closer to a million. However, by 1848, this number had dwindled down to less than 90,000. Explanations for this decline vary, with many historians citing war, famine, and disease as potential factors. Contemporary narratives largely focus on one primary cause, and that was the arrival of syphilis. It is likely that it was the constant influx of foreign traders brought about by Cook's arrival and a lack of efficient or effective treatment that caused this dramatic decline in just 70 years. Today, there is less than 600,000 people with native Hawaiian blood. The majority of us live outside of the Hawaiian islands and less than 1% of those Kanaka Maoli are pure Hawaiians. Today, in the place known as the state of Hawaii, the number of babies born with syphilis, known as congenital syphilis, ranged from zero to four cases per year from 2000 to 2019. Then in 2020, we saw 12 cases. In 2021, there was 20 cases um, and so forth. The numbers did climb as the years went on. So it shows that it is a 600% increase in just five years. This dramatic rise in congenital syphilis caused cases is one of the course associated with increased infections in adults. Across the United States, Native Hawaiians have the second highest rate of congenital syphilis, only second to American Indians and Alaska Natives, proving that historically Native people have been and continue to be the most impacted by this infection. So people asked about what do we do as Komakai? So what we did was through additional funding through our Department of Health Harm Reduction Services, we we're able to focus time and efforts in addressing this local crisis. Just by coincidence, we had an intern working towards her MSW. She was Hawaiian and she was from the community and she was pregnant. We we're able to hire her part-time to help us develop a project and materials that will be appealing to potential patients or parents and other women that may be at risk. We dissected her own prenatal care and services in the community um, and that had a presence. We were working towards specifically with Pacific Islanders who were expecting a baby. And we offered our support and services through linkage to insurance, expanded our outreach and mobile testing to new areas, free STI testing and treatment, food pantry through our caravan outreach program and navigation for other assistance they might need. So we wanted to make it okay for women who wanted to talk more about syphilis. So we gathered some key input from the women on our staff and came up with a message that was real, relatable, and we took it to the airways. We invited women to talk more about syphilis and motivate testing. So syphilis health check is a reliable and user-friendly rapid testing solution for the detection of syphilis antibodies by way of a finger stick with just a small amount of blood. It is the first and only CLIA wave FDA cleared rapid syphilis tests the accuracy is, up, is above 97%. And as Andrew mentioned, the results will appear within 10 minutes. So as Andrew also mentioned, remember this is a syphilis antibody test. So of course, if someone has had syphilis in the recent past, antibodies may still appear in the body for up to three years. It's important to go over the person's SDI history while you are doing the verbal consent piece of a testing encounter to determine if an antibody test is an effective way for them to be tested. So I wanna outline um, the primary, secondary, and tertiary that we went over previously. So obtaining a full sexual health history and examination of the patient is essential to properly stage the individual with regards to their syphilis diagnosis. Um, and again, the first line recommended treatment is um, penicillin. And if that is not available, there are alternatives. But of course, uh, if it's a female person and she's of childbearing age, you want to make sure she's not pregnant or do a pregnancy test. So alternatives can include doxycycline. 
um, tetracycline or cefatroxone. And I'm leave my questions for the end. If anybody has any questions or concerns um, about anything we went over, this is my contact information. If you want to learn more about Kumukai Health and Wellness, you can check us out on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, or go directly to our site. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, BJ, for that presentation. Um, let's look at the chat for questions. Um, there is a comment um, for BJ. Um, I am so glad you are providing the historical context that shows the hordes of colonization. It is not surprising that heavily oppressed and exploited people Native American, Alaska Native, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islanders throughout history and to this date have to suffer substandard, substandard health outcomes due to colonization, racism, and greed. Thank you. Let's see. Another question is, is there an antigen rapid test for syphilis? And that could be for um, and all the presenters. So currently there is none approved for use at this time, but we definitely need one along with one that provides titers as well. Okay, any other questions for BJ? Don, I think earlier in the um in the chat, someone brought up the um the potential of using, let me see if I can get that. The potential of using an instant, like a rapid treatment for um, folks that are coming in during Cheryl's conversation. And that's probably, it's probably a good opportunity to like get into that discussion with Andrew, Cheryl and BJ. It's really if, um, is there a better way and a quicker way to treat without having to stage um, and what is the common practice in all of those, the different clinics? Um, and then maybe some of the folks that are in the audience as well can chime in. Hi, so for Fort Peck, as soon as we get a positive, we're treating only because there's so many that don't complete their treatment course. So as long as we can get the first dose in there and kind of work with them and get that rapport going and they feel comfortable you know to see us and then we kind of send them to lab because it's we've had so many of that just don't complete their regimen that was the whole reason this program was kind of designed from COVID to STI in June so we're just trying to kind of play catch up almost with collaborating with IHS, but it, you know, we're always learning, like I said, because we are brand new. Any resources that people have for us, we're, we're willing to talk to. So let us know if you have any ideas. Yeah, I want to echo what Cheryl says for our organization. We try to get them, the patient, in as soon as possible. But if other clinicians or clinics or facilities have other feedback or options, we're always open to hearing about them. Yeah, Bridget in the chat mentions, um, what about initial treatment and then them not going to get additional labs for staging? That has been our downfall. And I think that's been an issue for Kumukahi as well. Yeah, I totally agree with you, Kiva. It's a work in progress, you know. You got to pivot and move with the times. I'm We've wondering, kind of doing, you... as soon as we get a positive, you know, we, we treat them and get the labs the same day, only because we don't know, you know. It, it is really kind of a hit and miss if you don't try and get it like that day. Mm-hmm. 
I'm just wondering, Andrew, if you know if there is um, some type of development of a rapid initiation with um, with using the rapid tests. Um, I know that that's kind of complicated for syphilis because of the staging process, but um, I'm, I'm wondering if things are being modernized because of the crisis. Yeah, so I'm part of a federal task force on syphilis and CDC and FDA are part of that task force. And so they are well aware that we need better technology. We need testing that's rapid, that can provide confirmatory testing so that everyone's eligible and not just those without a history of syphilis. Um, I would say going back to the question of what do you do in the case where someone received a single dose, um, but we weren't able to get blood work to help with that staging. Um, there is no perfect solution right now, but I would say one shot is better than none. And in the very case that that person truly was an early syphilis, um, they were completely treated. And so um, that would be my preference is that even if you can't get blood work, um, just having a single dose at least on the spot is, is better than none. Great advice. I'm going to read some of the things from the chat. Um, do you provide any documentation to the patient when you treat a pregnant person based on a rapid test in case they go to a different provider so that the provider is aware of treatment that was administered? We can start there. So our program being brand new and everything, we have been just giving them, you know, the information pamphlets that are provided by CDC and IHS and letting them, you know, it's just a little card. Yes, you know, they have one dose on this day of the bicillin. Like I said, it's really, we're trying to do our best and figure out what works best for the patient also. Because mm -hmm. if they do go to a different provider, we want, you know, at least have that documentation they they have on them. Um, Andrew, there's a question for you also. Will you please describe the home testing kit process as mentioned um, in your presentation? Um, so there are two options available. One was the syphilis antibody only, and then the other is a syphilis HIV antibody that's combined. Um, which tests would you like more clarity on? And you can come uh, up with me. That's easier. I'm not sure if they're still on. Syphilis only, Andrew. Um, in terms of how to use the testing kits, it's very simple. I think BJ can actually, and Cheryl can speak to it more since they use it more often than myself. Um, it's literally a finger stick. Um, you drop the blood in a pipette and then uh, put it into the testing kit and it takes, you know, 10 minutes to result. And it's either two lines for positive or one line for negative. The only problem with the syphilis only test is that you have to visually inspect. And those lines, when it's positive, can be very, very faint. It's like almost a, a very pale pink. And so there is a possibility of human er error. Um, if, so you have to make sure that you have good lighting. And if there's any hint of a pink in there, I just err on the side of caution and say that's a positive. Thanks, Andrew. I'm just going to go down the chat. You all are doing such great work and have such great information. Thank you. Linda says, that sounds easiest. Whoever is treating should draw for titers. Jessica says, we need better and more antibiotics options, including longer acting ones. Um, also shared medical records. So if they end up delivering, it can be noted. Andrew, can you please send me the source for the syphilis treatment guidelines for pregnant women that you shared earlier in the presentation? Um, Andy says, for all speakers, it seems like the congenital syphilis pandemic builds a case for having doxypep available. Absolutely. Are those conversations happening in terms of addressing root cause in initial infection pre-pregnancy? Has anyone successfully addressed the antibiotic overuse argument? Um, 
Michelle Horsch is asking more about the home test and what is the cost. Um, Andy is asking for free tests uh, for the public health office. And to piggyback off of Samantha's questions around patients going to a different provider after they've been treated, is it dangerous to an unborn baby for a pregnant woman to be treated multiple times? Thanks, Savannah, for getting the testing, um, ordering information out. You guys can have at all of that. <laughs> That's a lot of questions. Um, I can tackle the one regarding doxypep first. Um, so yeah, whenever I present on doxypep um, and the question of resistance and antimicrobial stewardship comes up, I just remind everyone that intermittent doxy use has been going on for a very long time. It's used for malaria prophylaxis. It's used to treat acne and skin infections. And so, yes, we do need to be vigilant about antibiotic use. But just because this is now a sexual health intervention doesn't mean that we need to be extra uh, scrutinizing the use of intermittent doxy um, for this purpose. Um, it should just be the baseline what, what, like we do uh, for any other purpose. And so that's my take on the uh, antibiotic overuse argument. Okay, um, we have one last question that's been kind of just hanging there. Um, it might be for Cheryl, but maybe BJ and um, Andrew can chime in. Uh, we're hearing that another barrier to prenatal care here is fear of child protective services in pregnant persons who use drugs. Has anyone had success with those conversations? I, I just want to speak for um, Hawaii Island. We don't have that um, in place. So our pregnant women are tested through prenatal visits. Um, if they're not able to come to the doctors, we have Mamas and Babies. It's a program that has registered nurse and clinicians, and they'll go and meet the patient where they are, whether it's on the street or at home to provide prenatal care, um, do testing. If they are positive for syphilis, they will go ahead and treat the individual. Yeah, for, for PEC here, we've had a huge success in decriminalizing that only because that fear of being turned in now you know, they're, they're feeling more comfortable with actually seeking prenatal care, which is something that was the cause we feel of the increase in congenital syphilis was the drug use and the alcohol and things of that nature. So they just weren't coming in for any prenatal care. Um, we're hoping that in the years coming, by decriminalizing that, um, people will feel more comfortable to say, you know, yeah, I have an issue and seek help. That's the best answer that I have right now. And I hope that it really does make a difference in the future of our people. Thank you, Cheryl and BJ. And one last question. Um, coming from uh, DOH, uh, we know if the patient needs one dose versus three doses, um, an unknown duration, quote unquote, I work for IHS, and how do you know if a person needs three doses with the rapid testing? So we actually send them or we'll draw their blood and send it for an RPR that day that they test positive. And, you know, just going through the health history with them and actually staging it is how we know if they need one or two or three doses. So I think that that's been an, uh, a challenge with Kumukahi um, as well is with the rapid test, it's the easiest and fastest way to get some type of result to know um, if we need to refer into the clinic. Um, however, we don't get lab work back that quickly. Um, and so it is dependent um, upon the, the patient coming back so that we can, one, conf well, we don't have to confirm it, but we can 
stage the titers and understand what type of treatment is best. Um, and so that's always been a consistent um, challenge. And so I think for us, it's really been the, the support piece, peer specialists using outreach um, support from your programs. If you're in combination with community programs that's within your clinic or vice versa, um, utilize, utilizing that staff to stay connected to these patients that we're trying to link to care. It's, um, it, you know, you can kind of take a look at HIV and use that same recipe um, when rapid initiation isn't available. Um, and because unfortunately the easiest and most desirable way for many community members to want to be tested is through a rapid test. And if you're doing it in outreach settings or if it's a home test kit, like these have all, all of these uh, types of tests need to be staged in order to determine a treatment. So it's it can take a little time. Thanks, Kiva, for that. Okay, we have um, a lot more questions. And if you have other questions, um, you can send us an email and we can follow up on those questions. But um. Thank you all for participating in today's webinar. Thank you again to Andrew, Cheryl, BJ, and um, Kiva. Kiva is one of our regional representatives with the network uh, representing the Hawaii region. <clears throat> okay, um, so we'll be sending out the evaluation for this webinar. Please complete those and send them back to us. Um, again, this webinar has been recorded and it'll be available on our YouTube channel, our Facebook page, and also our web page at www.nnhn.org. And you can also go there and be, sign up for a free membership to um, stay up to date on the different um, events that we're doing, like this webinar. Our next webinar will be in uh, March. So stay tuned for that. And you'll also receive our monthly ribbon song newsletter once you sign up for, for membership. So I wish you all a great rest of today. Yeah. Thank you, presenters. Mahalo, everyone. Thank Aloha. you, everybody. Have a good day. Take care.